friends, it's Mal. Welcome back to my YouTube channel if you're watching and welcome back to the Witch Church podcast if you're listening. Uh, if you are listening and you would prefer to watch this Mars retrograde forecast on YouTube, head on down to my show notes and you can click the link. Uh, but regardless, hey everybody, uh, excited to pop back on and talk a little bit about this upcoming Mars retrograde season. I thought it was a good time to start this discussion, especially because it is the first week of October, if you can't tell by my little black cat pillow. We've got the little ghosty here. It's the first week of October. And why is that significant? Well, this week on October 4th, Mars will enter their pre-retrograde shadow. Um, so once he gets to about 17 degrees Cancer, we'll be in the shadow, right? And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I feel like uh, the shadow periods, you know, it doesn't matter if it's Mercury retrograde shadow or Venus retrograde shadow. Um, Mars retrograde shadow, I often feel like the shadow periods are worse than the actual retrograde itself. Uh, but I thought we would just tune in to the energies of this upcoming Mars retrograde while we're entering the shadow period. It's the perfect time to talk about some of these themes. And just right at the top of this video, I want to note some important dates when it comes to this journey, <laughs> this very long journey we are about to go on with Mars. Uh, so like I said, October 4th, Mars will reach 17 degrees Cancer and thus enter his pre-retrograde shadow. Um, and we're in this pre-retrograde shadow for give or take about two months because it's not until December 6th, 2024 um, that Mars even officially uh, retrogrades. So that's the official first day of the retrograde period, December 6th. Mars will actually station retrograde at six degrees Leo. Um, so even though Mars will station in Leo, I would say it's a safe bet to say that most of this retrograde takes place in Cancer. So the way I'm seeing this retrograde is that it's mostly affecting that Cancer part of our chart, whilst the Leo part of our chart is kind of the background of the story. It's like the main story is that Cancer house, but then the background house is that Leo house. And we'll talk about that more once we get into the rising sign forecast, which is the main purpose of this video. Um, once Mars stations retrograde on December 6th, um, he will carry through his retrograde period until he stations direct February 23rd, 2025 at 17 degrees cancer so it's a, it's a long it's a long journey guys i'm telling you um you know I, I would not go into this period of time with the sort of attitude of i can't wait for it to be over because it, it's so long i i don't want us to you know, just be wishing it's over for the next like six to eight months. Um, and finally, I hate to break it to you, but it's really not until end of April. Technically, it's beginning first week of May 2025. Mars will exit that post retrograde shadow. Um, so it's really not until May 2025 where we're really completed with this Mars retrograde story. It's a big it's a big story, right? And I think that's why it might be important for us to even talk about 
the shadow periods too, because it's often the shadow periods that uh, reveal to us the themes or the archetypes of this retrograde narrative in our lives. Now, I do want to talk about Mars and Cancer in general first. And one thing I'll say, if you're familiar with the uh, essential dignities or just traditional Hellenistic astrology in general, if you don't know, I'm mainly a Hellenistic astrologer, uh, Mars is not doing so hot in Cancer. <laughs> we could say, we could say uh, Mars is in their fall in Cancer. Um, what does that mean in English? Well, um, really what it means is Cancer is a sign for Mars where he has trouble doing what he wants to do, how he wants to do it, right? Um, it's a little bit like if a repairman came over to your house to fix something and they thought you had all of the supplies, like, you know, they thought, oh, you're going to have a hammer and nails and uh, um, a screwdriver or whatever. And the repairman gets to your house and you're like, oh, I have, um, I have a feather and I have s some rope. And I have um, this uh, this violin, but I don't have any of the tools you actually need, right? And then Mars is like, what the heck? <laughs> I'm in this house and I know what I want to be doing, but I don't necessarily have the tools in order to do what I want to do. And now I have to improvise, you know, and also... Now I'm kind of crabby because I didn't want to be improvising. I just want to do my thing. Um, this is sort of the attitude of Mars being in Cancer um, and Mars being the planet of action, um, war, even severing. Uh, Mars often is the end of things like cutting or uh, whether that's a relationship or us walking away from something. These are all things that Mars is, we could say, predisposed to be good at. So we can imagine why uh, Mars doesn't really enjoy being in Cancer. Uh, cancer is the sign of the moon. The moon is an archetype that talks about, you know, nurturing and, uh, processing our environment and the moon is cyclical so you know mars can't really sever very well in cancer <laughs> because cancer uh holds on <laughs> you know cancer has a lot of trouble often letting go and needs to take um their time to process things right um, whereas Mars in his most, like, let's say empowered state, he's impulsive. He can just move on, you know, and in Cancer, he can't do that. Um, the other thing that kind of comes to mind when I think of Mars in Cancer is again, this is a Mars that is answering to the moon. In general, I think Mars has this vibe of, you know, I see it, I want it, I got it. Uh, there is uh, like this sort of, I have my eye on the prize. Think of the song, Eye of a Tiger, Q, Q, Eye of a Tiger. Like I have this goal and like now it's my focus and I'm not going to uh, change my focus until that prize or that medal is given to me, right? Um, so think about how hard it is to uh, keep your focus when you're ruled by the moon. And the moon being the fastest moving planet changes signs every two and a half days. Um, so it's almost like Mars is trying to be eye of a tiger, um, but then the song keeps switching. <laughs> 
the song keeps switching. Uh, and he, uh, he, his vibe keeps switching. And because he's ruled by the moon, it's like, oh my God, like I can't keep my focus because every two and a half days, um, I, I feel a new energy coming around and then I have to pivot what I was trying to do, right? Uh, so I hope that makes sense, but that's why I think Mars is a little bit um, irritated in Cancer, just generally speaking. Uh, and, uh, and again, I'm speaking more to, to the transit of Mars in Cancer more than um, if you have Mars in Cancer natally, um, which I'd be interested to know if any natal Mars in Cancers resonate with anything I just said about Mars in uh, his fall in Cancer. Um, natally, I think Mars in Cancer is not a bad thing necessarily. Um, I think it can be a lot about, um, you know, maybe even like fighting and nurturing those who have a disadvantage. So I could see someone with a very strong Mars in Cancer placement, like um, fighting for the rights of um, prisoners or fighting for um, the rights of houseless people. Like I could see Mars in Cancer natally being very passionate and emotionally connected to those who um, yeah, are at a disadvantage for one reason or another. Maybe the more difficult manifestation of having Mars in Cancer natally is uh, this um, hard time with uh, being led astray sometimes by our emotional state. Uh, you know, uh, Mars and Cancer can be emotionally reactive. Uh, Mars and Cancer is like, uh, you know, struggling with, uh, are my feelings really the reality of the situation? Should I act on these feelings? Or do I need to take a step back and read the room from a less emotionally invested perspective, which is inherently difficult for Mars in Cancer. That's kind of my overview of the placement itself. Um, now, I want to return quickly to the overall transit of this Mars retrograde. Um, one of the big things Mars does during this retrograde period is they will oppose Pluto a total of three times. Uh, this, I'm not going to lie to you guys, this is a little, uh, uh, this is a little rough here. I think this is maybe the hardest, these are the hardest points of the Mars retrograde that we could maybe take note of. Um, so the first opposition to Pluto will happen um, technically when we're still in the pre-retrograde shadow. That will be November 2nd, 2024. Uh, Mars in Cancer at 29 degrees will oppose Pluto at 29 degrees Capricorn. Um, then uh, fast forward to January 2nd, 2025. Mars will be in Leo. Yeah, Mars will be in Leo opposing Pluto to a, from Aquarius. Or Mars will be in Leo, Pluto will be in Aquarius. So the opposition is happening um, a, in a different axis than in November. And then come April... 26th, 2025, Mars will oppose Pluto a third time um, from Cancer, or sorry, from Leo and then um, 
Aquarius. Okay. Uh, so, you know, what could we say about generally a, a Mars, um, a Mars opposition to Pluto? Because we have the two planets that often symbolize something about war, something about power dynamics, now at tension with each other. Um, it's not the most relaxing vibe, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, an opposition itself is typically tension-filled. But something I also think about with the opposition is that um, it's often a moment when the phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back can come into play. Uh, like when we have a tough opposition, it is the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, in other words, it's the tension point that kind of breaks us a little bit and gives us no choice but to change. So when you hear like a story, or maybe you've even had this moment in your life, when, uh, you know, for year, months, even years, you're super frustrated with your job and you're like, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to walk out, you know, and you never do it. And then one day, you know, you finally, without notice, like something snaps and you walk out and you don't even put in your two weeks notice. It's, it's more of a complete severing of ties. Um, likely I would put my money on you having some sort of opposition <laughs> going on in your transits if that's ever happened to you. Because again, oppositions bring us to some tension with ourselves, our situation, our environment. Um, when I think of Mars having tension with Pluto, I think of how our actions, Mars, could be at tension with some sort of power dynamic, which is Pluto. Um, this sense of, I want to take the action I want to take, yet um, something is in my way, a hierarchy, um, a power dynamic, even the general patriarchal society that we live in, those are all things that are in my way and keeping me from maybe taking the aligned step forward that I want to take. Um, on a collective level, this transit makes me very nervous, especially with the U.S. elections coming up and um, all of the you know, atrocities we see on the news on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, on a personal level, I would say just be mindful of, you know, how do I actually get ahead of the straw that breaks the camel's back moment? Like, if I'm having resentful feelings, can I figure out how to voice them appropriately? Um, if I'm angry at someone, uh, what part of my inner child wounds are keeping me from letting that person know, you know? Um, yeah, you know, recently, it's funny, my, um, one of my friends, uh, they reached out to me and they, um, they let me know that something I said landed the wrong way with them and how it kind of hurt them. And they had come to me in a moment of vulnerability and um, my response to them was maybe harsh or uh, maybe not harsh because I, I wasn't trying to be harsh at all actually, um, but it was just not the response they needed. Let's, it, that's, you know, what happened. And when they told me about this situation, um, I was like so thankful that they let me know um, 
because it's so easy with our wounding, <laughs> you know, to not bring our resentments to the forefront or it's so easy to like not let the person know that they hurt us. And, um, you know, I, I'll say like, she felt comfortable letting me know that I hurt her because I think on some level, she also knows that I would totally be receptive to that kind of feedback and I would want to repair, right? Um, so paying attention to what relationships are like important and if we do have an important relationship in our lives this friend is very important to me i mean um don't let things stew you know <laughs> don't let things stew don't let yourself you know get resentful or feel bothered by something especially if it's with someone you deeply care about um and I think part of those Mars uh, oppositions to Pluto during this retrograde period are, are partially being honest about how we're feeling with our relationships, not letting things stew because it's very easy to potentially let things blow up, if you will. <laughs> um, you know, things could be blowing up during this time and just as a foresight, um, I just wanted to share, like sometimes it can be um, such a great moment for relationships when we air our grievances. It's like the episode of Seinfeld where they do Festivus. <laughs> Actually, that is literally the best um, Mars opposition, opposition Pluto um, example that I could think of, uh, the Festivus episode, if you don't know it, um, you can look it up, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like that, only hopefully we can have some healthy Festivus moments, we don't have to be, like, wrestling each other, although it is Hamar's retrograde, but, um, yeah, those are some general insights that come through right off the bat when it comes to, the highlights and the general themes of this Mars retrograde. Um, of course, I now want to get into, uh, want to get into the, uh, the rising sign forecast. Um, so before we do that, I'll share, uh, I am in the midst of teaching my first, uh, my first uh, astrology class and it's going really well. It's a, a fundamentals sort of neo-Hellenistic class and I'm already planning to probably teach it again sometime next spring. So check that out on my website if you've been looking for an astrology class that um, is aligned with you. Uh, yeah, take put that in your calendar. Uh, and also it's seeming that October is kind of sort of busy because I am traveling to an astrology conference. So I'm super excited about that. I'll be going to um, Salt Lake City for OPA or the Organization for Professional Astrology's um, retreat. So that will mean that my books are pretty limited for October. So if you are wanting to book with me, I would suggest doing that earlier rather than later. And then in November and December, we kind of enter um, one of my favorite times of the year as an astrologer, which is uh, year ahead reading season. Um, so I'll be updating those things on my website in uh in a month or so and starting to advertise coming into my office for a little year ahead forecast for 2025 holy moly are there some big shifts coming for 2025 um i wrote about this in my most recent newsletter which you can subscribe to in the show notes um but uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, 
and I guess we could say Pluto as well, um, will all ingress into new signs in 2025. So that for me strikes me as a very busy year. Um, so I would love to look into the year ahead with y'all. Um, so check all that, check all that out. Everything you need to know is in the show notes below. Okay, let's get a drink of coffee and we'll get into the uh, rising sign forecast. Okay, so also if you see me looking down, it's because I'm, I have my laptop open and I'm just looking at my charts. So don't mind me, uh, but Cancer Rising, uh, you know, this, this is going to be big, right? Uh, Cancer Rising will start with you because Mars will station retrograde technically in your second house, but most of this is going to be affecting the third house. Or sorry, the first house. I should know that since I'm a Cancer Rising. Uh, <laughs> so Cancer Rising, we've got the second house of money, resources, income, personal finances, and the first house of the self, identity, um, and I think our relationships and, you know, how we show up in the world is kind of a first house thing. First house is also our body, our relationship to our body, health. A lot of people tend to associate the sixth house with health, which I don't think is untrue, um, but I think we often forget that the first house is the literal body, right? So I think health stuff can be extremely relevant in this house. Um, so I, Cancer Risings, I was calling this the business rebrand <laughs> transit for y'all. Um, whether that's like literally you have a business and you're an entrepreneur or it's more like a personal rebrand, kind of like a sort of Taylor Swift uh, era's tour. Um, you know, it's, it's like, okay, I'm rebranding and I'm going into a different era. <laughs> um, and why do I say that? Well, I think as Mars stations retrograde in the second house of your income and livelihood, I'm thinking there's maybe some reorganization of finances going on or beginning to go on where you're saying, I'm going to take this next step in my life soon. What needs to happen to my finances um, in order for these goals to come into fruition? Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that I hear um, when it comes to the spiritual community, just talking about the topic of money that I, quite frankly, it rubs me the wrong way. Um, but something I heard someone say recently, I literally don't forget who, I forget who, who said it, but um, I was hearing something about how money equates to freedom. And I really liked that. Um, I liked that, that sentiment, that um, a good relationship with money um, is a relationship with our freedom. And the uh, sort of um, maybe wider ability to make choices that we want to make, right? Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that as I said, I'm a Cancer Rising, so this this retrograde is going to be uh, starting in that in that second house of money. By the way, not only am I a Cancer Rising, but I was born during a Mars retrograde in Leo. Um, you may be asking, are you freaking out, Mal? No, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I was listening to Austin Kopic on 
the astrology podcast and he was saying that um, Mars retrograde periods tend to be easier for natives with Mars retrograde in their chart and I don't know if that's true or false but I know I don't feel panicked going into this retrograde. I don't feel like, oh my God, I'm going to lose all my money. Um, it's more of a general sense of, um, okay, something with my f relationship to my finances needs to change in some way, or um, I need to reorganize things in some way. And thus, that will maybe expand my freedom and the potential to do what I want to do. Um, some of you know that I am planning to somehow, <laughs> in some way, hopefully, uh, live abroad um, in the next five years or so. So I'm already thinking, like, what needs to change financially in order for that to happen? Um, do I need to pay off certain debts first? Uh, how can I uh, develop my uh, income as an entrepreneur in, in a way where things are more um, stable or, you know, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, there's high highs, high lows. <laughs> some some uh, months are sink and other months are swim and you know that's sort of uh that's that's kind of the life sometimes of an entrepreneur yet um uh I think we're really thinking about how to just bring balance to our financial situation whether or not you are an entrepreneur or you are working a nine to five job where you receive a expected paycheck every two weeks regardless it doesn't matter so much when it comes to your job it's more about um your relationship to your resources i think that's a big theme for the cancer risings also as far as the personal rebrand <laughs> i think this can be sort of a first house retrograde kind of moment um, yeah, like, how do you want to show up? How do you want to, um, you know, introduce a new version of yourself to the world? Um, you know, do you want to, you know, dye your hair blue or whatever, get a new tattoo or um, come out as queer? Like, you know, something like that. Uh, it doesn't have to be any of those things specifically. But I think when Mars is in our first house, it doesn't when it's transiting our first house, it doesn't necessarily matter the sign. I think we get this opportunity to be a little bit more upfront with who we are and a little bit more unapologetic about who we are, right? Um, and, and something I will say is um, I've been noticing uh, with Mars just transiting my first house, I think I have been more willing to be confrontational, uh, not in like a asshole kind of way, but just in a, you know, confrontation is needed and sometimes confrontation is healthy in order for us to move forward. Um, you know, I've been noticing that and, you know, going back to the story I told about uh, like, you know, saying something that hurt my friend's feelings. Um, you know, I think I'm not, of course, I'm not like blaming Mars in my first house for my actions. But yeah, I mean, when Mars is transiting our first house, uh, yeah, we can be a little bit more aggressive than usual. Or we're coming in with the hot take. We are um, maybe a little bit, yeah, just unapologetic, more, more um, aggressive. <laughs> than we usually would be. Uh, and, you know, we might find ourselves being checked a little bit by that. Um, but I think it's a great time when it comes to the body cancer risings to like build muscle. Um, you know, if you've been wanting to change your diet in some way, um, you know, re 
rethinking the way you're nurturing yourself, implementing some sort of new workout routine, routine that could all be really great for Mars retrograde in the first house. Just don't hurt yourself. <laughs> if you're going to start lifting weights, start with a 10 pound dumbbell. Do not be a dumb bell and go and pick up, <laughs> you know, a hundred pound thing and try to do a, you know, a Russian deadlift, like, and, you know, break your back. Like, don't do something like that, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, I think those, those small but effective ways we might be changing our relationship to our body could be, yeah, really healthy in this moment. Okay, so that's my T for Cancer Risings. Um, let's go to Leo Risings uh, because you will be having the bigger chunk of the retrograde cycle in the 12th house of the subconscious. Um, and then we have Leo as your first house of identity. Um, so I'm thinking for the Leo Risings, um, I, have, uh, I have written down the fear of showing up as who we are and that being confronted during this Mars retrograde. Uh, so I think, uh, I think it could be, uh, let's say you're a Leo rising and you have sort of a, a hobby that you really enjoy, but it's kind of nerdy or you don't really talk about it with many people. Like, let's say you're, um, I'm trying to think of a nerdy hobby, like you're on a D&D &D team or you're like, I don't know, guys, uh, you're into astrology. You know, I'm also into a nerdy, I'm in a very nerdy realm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's just say you have an interest or even a passion, we could say, uh, that you have downplayed or you haven't been very forthcoming when it comes to this passion, uh, let's say you're playing on a roller derby league or something and you don't really tell many people about it. Um, this retrograde is sort of an opportunity to ask yourself, why do I have a fear of letting people know about my passions? And in unpacking that, it's like, oh, I'm gonna invite my friends to like my roller derby game or I'm inviting my mom and dad to my improv show or like I mean that could be a little too far but you get what I'm saying here like uh it, you know you're not hiding anymore if there has been something that's been feeling a little bit hidden or taboo in your life uh whether it's about a hobby or just some aspect to yourself um, I think the 12th house often brings us uh, some sort of opportunity to face that thing that we thought was taboo and uh, then kind of come out with it and it sort of sets us free. Uh, so I, I think this could be a very powerful time, especially for the, the Leo risings. Um, and I'm excited to see what kind of fears are overcame, overcame, overcome, are overcome <laughs> during this period. Uh, because I think there's a real um, dragon that is being slayed, if you will, and it, it affects how you are going to show up with more authenticity, I think. Okay, Virgo rising, uh, we've got most of the retrograde happening in the 11th house of groups and networks, and that's cancer for you, the 11th house, and then we also have the 12th house of the subconscious in Leo. Um, 
So I have here when I was meditating on the Virgo rising stuff, um, I think there could be a possibility of maybe something unseen that is happening in the realm of networks, groups, connections. Um, perhaps you learn a specific piece of information when it comes to your networks. Uh, because the 12th house is sometimes things that we don't see. Uh, we don't see until an, uh, a sort of outside transit then triggers <laughs> that, that place in our chart. So I'm thinking um, uh, what is going to be seen? I don't know. Is it that you realize something, a group of, um, a friend at work that you thought was loyal to you ends up taking your customer. Like, I don't think it needs to be that dramatic, but just an example of something that could be going on in those groups and networks that you didn't see coming. Um, you know, your client calls you and says, we're going with someone else or, um, uh, you know, something along those lines. And uh, I think the key for the Virgo risings is to remember, especially during this retrograde period, um, what is meant for you does not miss you. And what misses you is not meant for you. Um, so if for some reason, you have to reevaluate a certain group or network that you're a part of um, or a certain connection that you thought was solid, but now for whatever reason is maybe expired. <laughs> um, can you click in to the frequency that, okay, if something is not meant for me, I need to let it go and I need to remain in the belief that the next thing is coming, you know, that that is aligned for me. I know that's easier said than done and I'm not trying to downplay, you know, some of the grief or the frustration that can come with um, some of that networking stress, uh, but I think that could be a really helpful energy to put out there. The other thing I'm thinking about, uh, something more positive for the Virgo Risings, it's possible that some, uh, because retrogrades sometimes add up to the past, it's, um, it's worthwhile to think about the allies of the past, um, who has been helpful in the past, could there be an old friend, an old business connection um, that ends up being really helpful during this retrograde period that might even be the key to the next opportunity for you? Um, so think about that Virgo rising as well. Um, but overall, I think this retrograde period is, believe it or not, leading you to a more aligned um, sort of pod of, of friends and networking connections that can help you move forward. Especially, this is off topic, but especially seeing that Uranus, you know, next summer, uh, like, July 2025 is going to enter Gemini, which is your 10th house of career. So whatever networking connection stuff is rearranging itself during this Mars retrograde period between now and end of April is actually setting something up for next summer. Okay. Um, Libra rising. So this, the bigger chunk of this retrograde is happening in the 10th house of career, which is cancer for you. Um, but then we also have Leo as your 11th house of friendships and networking. Um, it's interesting because I know 
um, two of my very close friends are Libra Risings and one of them just got a promotion that they had been waiting on for a long time. Um, so I have a feeling that this Mars retrograde, mostly in their 10th house of career, will kind of be the adjustment period when it comes to taking on greater responsibilities at work, which can be very much a 10th house theme. Um, another one of my Libra rising friends is um, going to be speaking at a conference basically as as Mars stations retrograde in their 11th house of groups and networks. So as you can see, it's not always a bad thing to have Mars in retrograde because sometimes it helps us um, go back in order to move forward with more alignment. So I'm wondering, you know, with this Libra rising going to speak at a conference that first week of December, again, when Mars is going to station in their 11th house of groups and networks, I wonder who are they going to meet? Are they going to, you know, meet their next job opportunity? Um, is there going to be a career shift that results of uh, from this networking opportunity? Um, that could be a big Libra rising um, shift. Uh, I know another Libra rising who is um, leading a new class and I can really see that online course or class that she's teaching being a foundational building block to the future of her business. Again, I wouldn't necessarily panic for the Libra Risings that this is going to be, oh my God, I'm getting fired from my job. It's a 10th house retrograde or I'm quitting my job. It could be for, let's say 15% of the Libra Risings. I think there could be something big like that going on but I think for most of the Libra risings it's uh it's reading to me as um a energetic adjustment to career shifts that have already been ongoing okay uh Scorpio rising we've got the ninth house tenth house retrograde going on, your ninth house being Cancer, 10th house being Leo. The ninth house um, typically has to do with education, um, school, higher ed, just even learning something new, getting another degree. Um, I'm even thinking a little bit ahead of the game here, but um, June 2025, Jupiter will move into Cancer as well, into the ninth house of career. So that makes me feel like whatever's going on now with these questions, like, do I go back to school? Do I learn something new? Do I need a new skill set for something? Um, I think, you know, whatever story from this Mars retrograde in Cancer Leo is going to feed into whatever happens when Jupiter enters Cancer later. Um, but regardless, Scorpio rising, I would say um, maybe there's some unpacking to do when it has to do with your conditioning, which is a ninth house theme. Uh, for instance, let's say you are a Scorpio rising and you do want to go back to school. Um, maybe you're like, why? Why do I want to go back to school? Is it because um, my society has led me to believe that having a master's degree or a PhD will make me successful? Um, is it something with my family? Is it something with my self-esteem? Or is this something that I truly want? Um, again, I'm speaking to those Scorpio Risings who might have that theme of going back to school coming up. Not all of you will have that theme. Um, some of you will be maybe learning a new skill set when it comes to work 
because again, part of this retrograde is happening in the 10th house of career um, for the Scorpio Risings who are going back to school. Um, this feels related to unhappiness when it comes to the current career path and wanting to change that, right? Um, the other thing I'm thinking about with Scorpio Risings, the ninth house has to do with travel. Um, the ninth house has to do with um, experiences that expand our horizons. Um, it's sort of the Elizabeth Gilbert, eat, pray, love um, kind of thing, right? Uh, or uh, the Cheryl Strayed um, book. What is it called? I'll think of it, but um, the memoir that Cheryl Strayed wrote about hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, like both of those books are very ninth house stories. Uh, my life wasn't going the way I wanted it to go and I needed to travel or simply do something to get out of my everyday environment and completely immerse myself in something different so I could get a better perspective on my life, right? Um, so I would say for some Scorpio Risings, like if you have the resources to take a solo trip, do it. I mean, if you're feeling lost and you need perspective, um, definitely consider a, a literal change in perspective, <laughs> you know, going, going somewhere new in order to figure out what it is that you really want, taking some space from your everyday life and yeah, getting that, getting that new horizon uh, feels like something this Mars retrograde might bring to the Scorpio risings, okay. Um, so going on to Sagittarius risings, it's funny, I put student loans. <laughs> student loans, apparently, was something I wanted to mention. Um, because Sagittarius rising, your eighth house is cancer, right? And the eighth house is taxes, loans, insurance, debt, partners, money, um, inheritance, or benefits that come to us through death. Um, and then the ninth house can be school, can be higher ed. Um, who knows? Maybe you're a Sagittarius rising and, you know, this this Mars retrograde will be you paying off your student loans or <laughs> paying off some kind of debt, I think would be a good use of this time. The eighth house reminds us, though, that not all debts are monetary, uh, especially when it comes to like family karma <laughs> and relationship karma. Um, sometimes we have energies that are related to ancestral trauma or, um, you know, our childhood narratives and quote unquote paying off those debts looks more like emotional and energetic release. Um, so Sagittarius Risings, I think it actually might be a good time during this Mars retrograde period, if you feel called, if you feel this is aligned, like maybe go get some energy work done. Um, whether that's like Reiki or craniosacral, um, you know, some kind of shamanic healing. Um, you know, if you know an energy worker in your community or whatever, um, it, I think it's a really good time to potentially move some of that, those subconscious energies that can lie dormant in the eighth house. Uh, the ancient astrologers called the eighth house the idle place. Um, so I think a lot of times things can get a little stuck in the eighth house energetically. Uh, for some reason, I'm getting a very strong uh, image right now of a uh, sensory deprivation tank, <laughs> which is very eighth house cancer. Um, 
And if you don't know what a sensory deprivation tank is, um, it's my understanding that it's, you kind of like float in this tank filled with water, but the way um, the water is, I don't know if it's like salt or something, but it makes you float and it kind of just makes you feel like your senses are taken away and it lets you allow yourself to be um, just with the mind. It's almost like a meditative ritual. Um, so if you happen to have ever thought about doing something like that, or um, maybe you have a bigger city near you and you have some kind of sensory deprivation tank uh, like facility somewhere by you, it, it could be something that you end up doing. I'm just sharing that I didn't expect that to come through but that's something that did come through um yeah I think that's good for Sagittarius risings um Capricorn risings so the main chunk of this retrograde will be happening in your seventh house which is cancer which is also your house of relationships marriage partnership um, and then keep in mind, Leo is your eighth house of partners, money, shared resources, um, taxes, loans, insurance. Funny enough, I, uh, I know a, uh, cap rising. Actually, I know two, two cap risings <laughs> who are, um, doing some family planning right now um one is going to have a baby and the other is planning to have a baby and for me that is so it's not only a fifth house thing to have a baby right it's also a seventh house eighth house thing because your relationship to your partner is changing and becoming something new now that you're becoming parents together um, and then the eighth house, though, is also those resources that maybe are being reorganized collectively between you and your partner in order to invite this child into the world, right? Um, so I think this could be a big family planning uh, retrograde for some Capricorn Risings. Um, for other Capricorn Risings who, you know, don't resonate or aren't in the place in their life where they would be family planning. Um, I think in general, just relationship themes being at the forefront. Is this partner, um, are, uh, is this partner, are they aligned with me? Are their values aligned with me? Um, sometimes too, uh, this reminds me with seventh house, eighth house stuff, Unfortunately, I mean, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but sometimes, I mean, values when it comes to money, it, it is a big thing when it comes to partnership. So if you are realizing my values when it comes to money are much different than my partners, and this is making me rethink our future, that could be uh, this, this retrograde. I'm a saver, they're a spender. Um, I paid off my debt. They have a hundred thousand dollars of debt. You know, like those are real things that um, should at least be talked about. It's not to say you and your partner have to break up, but I think there could be some really important um, discussions when it comes to money happening, especially between partners. If you are single, cap rising, um, I could see this Mars retrograde actually being a um, uh, a reevaluation of your singlehood. <laughs> and that could mean a million different things. It could be, oh, I've totally been shut down from the dating world for a long time. And now I'm going to put myself back out there in a new way. It could also be uh, why am I dating all these bozos? I need to take a step back and be in a bit of a celibate 
era for a little while to reevaluate what I'm actually looking for. It could be either one of those things. Um, but typically retrogrades tend to send us in the diff a different direction, right? So think about that. Whatever direction you are in with your partnership, think about that direction being reevaluated or even your relationship to partnership. Okay, it doesn't have to be a specific partner. Okay, Aquarius rising. We've got the retrograde. The biggest chunk of the retrograde is in your sixth house, which is your cancer house. Sixth house tends to do with, has to do with um, our daily life. I also relate the sixth house to how our work life affects our health. For instance, if we're going through a really stressful time at work and we throw our back out or even worse, you know, we have a heart attack or like, again, I don't want to cause anxiety, but I think our work life does affect our bodies, especially in the realm of capitalism. Um, so for some Aquarius risings, there could be a little bit of like, I'm putting my foot down with um, the way I have been relating to work because I am now wanting to prioritize my health and I want to get back into my daily schedule. I want to work out. I want to go to a doctor and figure out this um, situation. I would say especially the Aquarius risings and the Pisces risings um, because the Mars retrogrades are affecting your sixth houses, um, you know, if something comes up, go to the doctor, like just go, um, you know, it, go get it checked out. You know, that feels like a good, I would say that's a good advice for everybody <laughs> during a Mars retrograde. Um, maybe the Cancer Risings too, since Cancer is the first house of the body, um, so, and Leo rising too, because Leo's the first house of the body. So I would say, especially Leo rising, Cancer rising, Pisces rising, Aquarius rising. If something health-wise comes up, go to the doctor, okay? Don't, don't be, uh, you know, procrastinating that. Um, now, Aquarius rising, uh, Leo is also your seventh house of relationships, um, there could be a reorganization of your daily schedule when it comes to your partner. It's funny, I could see like, what if, um, you know, an Aquarius rising recently got married and you're deciding like, oh, um, my husband really wants to be a stay-at-home dad. So we're reorganizing my uh, work life so he can do that. You know, there's something here about how our schedules come together when we're partnered. Um, and I think that could be really um, a good thing, a beneficial thing to discuss, especially for the Aquarius risings. I also have the word sustainability written down, which I think is a sixth house key word, at least for me. Um, like, is this a sustainable way of living my life? Um, is this um, good for my long-term health mentally and physically? Uh, or do I need to change something and come back to the basics when it comes to um, how sustainable my patterns are? or how sustainable it is to live my life in this way. Um, I'll move on to Pisces rising because I would actually ask you the same question. Um, because the sixth house for you is Leo. And again, this is the house where we consider sustainability. We consider, is this lifestyle really suited for me or what do I have to change in order to um, make this lifestyle healthier for me? 
Um, Pisces rising, though, the, the main chunk of the retrograde will be happening in the fifth house of creativity, um, which is your cancer house. So funny, I'll share a quick story. A good friend of mine is a Pisces rising and uh, she's a very talented singer. And for the past year or so, she's been working with um, a producer uh, to produce her first album. And recently, I mean, I won't give, you know, the dirty details, but we'll just say recently, the, um, she's had a huge conflict with this producer. And it wasn't anything she did. Um, it was more on the um, producer's end. And um, seems like the producer really just flipped, um, like kind of flipped the whole situation on her, you know? And, you know, she's telling me about this and I know she's a Pisces rising. Um, and I'm thinking, holy crap, this is such a fifth house retrograde kind of topic. Um, because the fifth house relates to creativity, it's also our, our creative children, right? It's the album we're producing. It's the book that we're writing. Um, and it's the painting that we're working on. Uh, and, you know, her album is her baby. <laughs> you know, and now there's this challenge that it's presenting itself with her baby, you know, and that's her creative child and that's stressful. And um, I'm thinking about how perhaps this retrograde period uh, will clarify for my Pisces rising friend, maybe, uh, who is really meant to be working on her project with her. Uh, I know better than anybody, you know, being a um, creative myself, uh, it's really important to like, trust your mentors or your peers. And, and it sucks when we learn that um, someone that we thought was aligned with our creative project isn't actually aligned with it. Um, but then ultimately at the end of the day, I think the Mars retrograde in the sixth and fifth might be asking um, us to really commit to our integrity when it comes to our creative projects and, uh, you know, not um, betraying our integrity in order to follow someone else's guidance that isn't even aligned with us. Um, on the other hand, I think, although I just gave a really negative example of a kind of creative project of my friends, you know, having a huge challenge. Oh, I think for most Pisces Risings, this could be an incredible time to like go take a writing retreat or uh, take some time to yourself, work on your creative project, reevaluate, edit, Maybe you finished your book and now you're in your editing process. Um, maybe you started uh, a creative project years ago and it's been on pause and now it's time to revisit that project. Um, there's so many beautiful things that could happen with this fifth house transit. Um, and, uh, you know, for the Pisces Risings where the fifth house is coming through as literally children, um, I would say some Pisces Risings will notice their kids maybe going through an adjustment period. Uh, maybe there's an adjustment period happening at school with a new teacher. Uh, maybe it's someone going from high school to college or middle school to high school. There's something like that where some Pisces Risings with children might be um, kind of adjusting to this new version of their child. Um, another thing too that comes to mind with sixth house, fifth house stuff, I think about our relationship to pleasure and sexuality um, and really 
sensuality too. And uh, if some Pisces risings have felt stagnant in that realm, maybe there's a Pisces rising out there who's going to take like a burlesque class or something. Um, you know, there's something there with um, how do I reignite my feelings of my own sensuality when it doesn't necessarily have to do with being desired by another. It's more about desiring myself and thinking of myself as like sexy or hot or whatever. Uh, some Pisces risings might be realizing it's been a second since I really like relied on myself for um, sort of coming through with those feelings versus relying on a partner or the outside world to make us feel desirable. Just a few things that come to mind. <laughs> uh, okay, Aries rising, uh, we've got, uh, we've got the, um, retrograde going on in the fourth house of the home primarily which is your cancer house and then we have the fifth house of creativity and pleasure uh certainly there could be some kind of creative project going on for the aries risings as well but i would also say that the fourth house of the home seems to be the biggest focus it's funny i i heard an Aries rising say to me maybe a couple weeks ago how badly they were wanting to move and change their home environment and uh that could be kind of an Aries rising thing right now some of you guys are really considering like okay I want to move to a different state a different place. Uh, I need a change in the realm of my home life. And I think that will come through. Just remembering, not all of you, this won't happen for all of you right now. Um, we could still be in this planning phase, but that doesn't mean nothing is happening behind the scenes. And I think it's going to be so positive next summer once Jupiter enters Cancer and enters your fourth house of the home. Uh, I think all of the unknown and the planning and the data collection and the experimentation when it comes to the home life will eventually pay off. Some Aries Risings could be doing the move right now. Um, who knows? Uh, but at the same time, I think if you have no idea where you want to move, it could be a good time to experiment with a few different trips, things like that. Um, when it comes to the fifth house of creativity um, and its relationship to the fourth house of the home, I'm being reminded of an Aries rising client, I had a, about a month ago, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about how um, Virginia Woolf had a writing shed. And, uh, you know, she went to that writing shed in her backyard every day and it acted as her creative studio. And she ended up writing this uh beautiful essay called A Room of One's Own. And it was uh, sort of a feminist take on during that period of time where she said, women need a place outside of the home to go and work on their stuff. Men have always had their offices, but women need that too. Um, so I was talking about this with my client who uh, it actually was thinking like, I need a place outside of my home to work on my creative projects, right? Uh, so I think that could be in a weird way connected, uh, fifth house, fourth house stuff. Like, am I going to rent an office? Maybe I find a 
partner in the um, creative realm who can split the cost of this uh, this creativity studio with me or something along those lines. I think it could be beneficial for the Aries Risings to actually leave the house or make a special space in the house that is dedicated to the creative project or even just dedicated to reconnecting with your own self. Okay, um, coming up on Taurus Risings, um, we also have the fourth house of the home in Leo. Um, and the third house of siblings in Cancer. So I think out of everybody, the Taurus Risings may have um, a story developing when it comes to their siblings. I wonder if some Taurus Risings have a sibling getting married. Maybe there's some kind of sibling conflict that's being ironed out. Um, you know, my dad is a Taurus rising and he is um, uh, one of the primary caretakers of one of his siblings. So, you know, that makes me um, interested to see how that develops over the Mars retrograde period. Um, but I think there's some theme about going back in time with a sibling in order to sort something out. Um, even if you're writing your sister or your brother's, you know, speech for their wedding, uh, there is something about like going back in time, reviewing those scrapbook moments and, uh, and sort of, uh, yeah, coming to a certain narrative or story about your relationship in the present and going into the future, uh, conflict resolution with, Siblings could certainly be a part of this Mars retrograde. For the Taurus Risings, I also think about how Leo is the fourth house of the home. The fourth house is also associated with our ancestors' death and endings. Um, so for a very few Taurus Risings, you know, this could be a period of time, maybe you're dealing with the passing of a parent a passing of a grandparent. And now you're faced with this moment where you're having to work with your siblings in order to uh, sell the house, go through the stuff, um, examine the will. Uh, you know, there's something here when it comes to the relationship with the family and the ancestors. Again, that's not all Taurus Risings, that's very few of you. But that's one way I can see the fourth house and the third house connecting with each other. Um, the third house can also be about uh, our mental state and our way of communicating. Uh, sometimes I refer to the third house as the throat chakra house. Um, so out of everybody, I think the Taurus risings with that Mars retrograde going through the third house be careful of what you say. Be careful of the messages you're relaying, especially if you're feeling anger or resentment. Uh, refer back to some of the general themes I was talking about in the beginning when it comes to communicating anger and resentment. Um, and usually Taurus risings are, um, you know, uh, more amicable. Uh, when it comes to maybe um, communicating conflict. But I think there's something about this Mars retrograde in the third house that makes the Taurus Risings a little bit spicier than usual. Okay. Um, yeah, let me know below, Taurus Risings. I'm especially interested how this theme is presenting itself for you. Um Lastly, we have Gemini rising. So the bigger chunk of this retrograde is happening in Cancer, which is your second house of money. Um, and the second house can also be about finances and our livelihood. 
and also our money stories. Um, the third house also is somehow connected to this retrograde just because your third house is in Leo. Mars will station retrograde in Leo at the beginning of December. Um, for me, I was talking to my uh, therapist friend the other day at work and uh, she practices a type of therapy called IFS. If you are um, a client of mine or a student of mine, you've heard me talk about IFS, which is short for internal family systems. It's a type of therapy, um, I think established by um, a psychotherapist named Richard Schwartz. Um, and there's a book called No Bad Parts by Richard Schwartz that I recommend to a lot of my clients. So whenever you hear people talking about parts work or inner child work, um, it's usually relating back to IFS theory. Why do I bring this up? Well, me and my therapist, me and my therapist friend were talking about money parts and how, uh, you know, our inner child or the parts of us sometimes relate to money from a place of trauma even with our parents and sometimes we inherit money stories from our parents that aren't necessarily aligned with us as an adult so um you know let's say your parents grew up in extreme poverty and uh you know uh like to this day live in that energy um and you as an adult let's say you're fine you know you don't luckily you were able to um you know let's say get a high paying job or something but yet your nervous system you're finding remains in that extreme hypervigilance when it comes to being afraid uh, of losing everything or something along those lines. Um, you know, Gemini Rising, I think regardless of that story applying to you or not, um, I think you're having this bigger realization, this aha moment about your relationship to money and how it might have been inherited or how your money story might be your actually your mom's money story or your dad's money story it's not actually your relationship to money and i think this mars retrograde could be a really good time to examine those patterns um and i think out of everybody the gemini risings um i would say be mindful of your spending habits uh, during this retrograde. Um, if you are considering like a bigger important purchase and you've been thinking about that for a while, I would say that's fine. Um, but if there's like a lot of frivolous purchases that you are making, especially ones that are motivated from like an emotional place, um, you know, it's the movie Confessions of a Shopaholic. You know, it's kind of that. Uh, like if you're feeling sad, don't just go blow 200 bucks at Home Goods because you're buying like 10 candles that you don't need, you know? Uh, I would say Gemini Risings should be particularly mindful of their spending habits and um, how that might be affecting their life in general and i would say this retrograde period would be a better time to save um maybe even watch some youtube videos about like a no spend month to gain some inspiration <laughs> uh but uh i would say it's a better time for saving paying off debt versus buying things Again, if it's an already pre-planned important purchase, it's something bigger that you have needed for a while, 
um, like you're buying your first apartment, you've thought about it for a long time, you're buying a car, you're buying a laptop, these are all things you've considered for a long time, then it's fine. But I'm more talking about the frivolous spending of things that are more motivated from like needing to burn off emotional steam versus um, things that are actually aligned, okay? Um, that's what I've got for you guys uh, for the rising sign forecast. Thank you so much for listening. As you guys know, I always love to read your stories in the comments. It helps me learn as an astrologer when it comes to maybe some of the things that you're relating to with this upcoming Mars retrograde in Cancer and Leo. Um, and again, I think because it's such a long transit, I would invite all of us to go into this with an open heart and open mind. Let's invite in the themes and really listen to the wisdom of Mars instead of, you know, wishing it is over for the next eight months because that won't serve us, <laughs> especially during such a long time. And also remember, Mars only stations retrograde about once every two and a half years. So we don't have this transit like every day. So I think it's it's important to really, yeah, approach this with some mindfulness. And I hope that this forecast can help us do that. Um, so guys, I'll see you in the next episode. And thank you so much for listening.